Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. Oh, yeah. Hi, howdy. How the hell y'all doing, my fellow lockdown friends? Hopefully you're doing all right. Hopefully you're surviving uh, the lockdown. Uh, and you get another 30 days. Aren't you just so happy about that? You get all the way till the end of uh, April now, at least four now. That may be extended. I would imagine it'll be extended as the end of April approaches. It would go out even further. So isn't that just wonderful? Anyway, this is the Grim Leftover Show. I am Grimner. It's March 30th, 2020. Uh, just a little after 5 o'clock here at Mountain Time Zone. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, so, <laughs> let's say hi and howdy. Oh, yeah, by the way, uh, if you're looking at the uh, either the reallibertymedia.com show page or or, or the freaking the <laughs> Grim Leftovers show page or the rlmradio.xyz page, you'll notice, hey, that looks different. That looks like a different player. It is a different player because I'm on a different... Uh, streaming hosting company now uh, for now anyway uh, I don't know my if my other hosting company is ever going to ever come back and respond to me and fix my server but uh, it's been like four days now nothing so I think they're all out on coronavirus vacation yeah vacation all they ever wanted um, so uh, I don't know but uh, I signed up with this new one and uh, so we're here now and it's 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 a uh, it's a little different and some things are better some things are not eh, it is what it is that's okay i deal with it um yeah okay anyway hi and howdy to all the folks over there on freedomsnetwork.com those of you on realliberty.org uh and especially those of you here in the chat at realliberty.com on irc.freenode.net yes coronation Woohoo! <laughs> put it down, put it down. Um, <laughs> but we got a nice group of folks here, we always do. Uh, and they're in here, and they're talking about things, various things, not just the coronavirus, but the police state in various methods, uh, the, 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 the crappy-ass, the murderous police that just love killing people for no reason and then and then denying any responsibility for it. Uh, but that's just part of the normal conversation here in Real Liberty Media. We, we talk about all kinds of things. Just just a, the full gamut of stuff. Oh, did I do a now thing? Let me do a now over here in the chat, just to be sure uh, that everybody knows that, yeah, hey, he's here, he's live, he's gone, he's going. So anyway, hi and howdy to all you folks over here in the chat. You know who you are, don't you? Anyway, I see chatting in there, uh, Rob Works, Miss Kate, Meester Beisterbrow, uh, I saw Moose Girl a little bit earlier, Gram Z. Oh, get better, Grammy. Get better. We need you around here. Um, that, that's uh, your your little problem there, man. Little Hanso, you tuned in, man? I don't know. The uh, one, one of the things the uh, new server doesn't tell me is where the people that are tuned in are from. It gives me an IP address, and I can look up individual IP addresses, but I ain't doing all that shit. Um, <laughs> it was kind of fun before. Uh, there's Sock Puppet, too. Hey, Socker! Uh, so, uh, yeah, um, anyway, this is episode 65 of the Grim Leftovers. Let's kick this thing off right now. And this may be one of the most dramatic, drastic, terrible problems so far coming out of the coronavirus pandemic panic freak out. And if you don't know about this yet, and you haven't stocked up on these yet, you might want to consider it because this could be a big, big problem for y'all. <laughs> From the Guardian dot com. Global condom shortage looms as coronavirus shuts down production. Oh no. So the world's biggest producer says the lockdown has already caused a shortfall of 100 million condoms. you got to wrap that rascal. But no, 
The global shortage of condoms is looming. The world's biggest producer has said after a coronavirus lockdown forced it to shut down production, Malaysia Carex BHT makes one in one in every five condoms globally. It has not produced a single condom in its three Malaysian factories for more than a week because of a lockdown imposed by the government to halt the spread of the virus. Talk about a baby boomer coming. Whoo! Uh, <laughs> that is already a shortfall of 100 million condoms normally marketed internationally by brands such as Durex supplied to the state healthcare systems such as Britain's NHS or distributed by aid programs such as UN's Population Fund. The company was given permission to restart production on Friday, but with only half of its workforce under a special exemption for critical industries. It will take time to jumpstart factories, and we will struggle to keep up with demand at half capacity. We are going to see a global shortage of condoms everywhere, which is going to be scary. He said, my concern is that for a lot of humanitarian programs in Africa, the shortage will not just be two weeks or a month. The shortage can run into months. Malaysia is the Southeast Asia, in Southeast Asia, uh, worst affected country with 2,161 coronavirus infections and 26 deaths. The lockdown is due to remain in place until the 14th of April, probably much longer. The other major condom-producing countries are China, where the coronavirus originated and led to widespread factory shutdowns, and India and Thailand, where infections are rising. Makers of other critical items, such as medical gloves, have also faced hiccups in their operations in Malaysia. The good thing is that the demand for condoms is still very strong, because, like it or not, it's still an essential to have, Go said. Uh, given that at this point in time, people are probably not planning to have children, it's not the time with so much uncertainty. But since everybody's locked in at home, <laughs> them condoms are going to be in high demand. High demand, let me tell you. You better, <laughs> you better stock up on them rubbers right now. Yes, indeed. You gotta, you gotta have that protection. Oh boy, let me tell you, whoo, that's gonna be a baby boom like you ain't never seen. <laughs> There's a Corona generation coming your way. Uh, massive. It'll, 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 it'll make the baby boomers seem like nothing. Uh, yeah, cause they're all locked in, but they're locked in with their, uh, their, their mates. And well, what else you gonna do? You're locked in all the time. And if you don't have the condom, you're going to still, you're going to still do it. You're going to still do it. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> All right. ArsTechnica.com. This was posted on February 18th. The future of work looks like staying out of the office. And I got to give you... Hooray for that. That's the way it should have been for several years now. But it hasn't been. And why hasn't it been? They don't trust you. Your employers don't trust you. They're now forced to trust you whether they can or not. So staying out of the office, working from home, huh, workers are happier. They're more productive. More things get done in less amount of time. And the employers don't have to for, fork out the money for that huge building and all the office supplies there. It's all being done at home. Dozens of studies find remote workers happy and productive. Why not let them be? In 2020, we finally live in the future or at least a future, one where the broadband internet connections and portable, reasonably high-powered computing tools are pervasive and widely accessible, even if they aren't yet universal. 
Millions of workers, including all of those there at ARS Technica, use those tools to do traditional office jobs from non-traditional home offices. Tens of millions of jobs at all points of the income and skills spectrum are, of course, not suited to remote work. Doctors, dentists, countless other healthcare workers of the world will always need to be hands-on with patients just as teachers need to be in schools. No, that's not true. Teachers do not need to be in schools. Uh, construction workers, they do need to be on building sites. Scientists do need to be in labs. Wait staff does need to be in restaurants. Judges do need to be in court. And hospitality employees, rooms, need to be in hotels. All of that said, though, many more of the hundreds of different kinds of jobs Americans do can be done off-site. Roughly a quarter of us are already doing at least some work remotely. About 24% of U.S. workers employed full-time did some or all of their work at home, according to the most recent federal data available. Even as some workplaces become increasingly distributed around the nation and the world, though others are reversing course and doubling down on the corporate campus, so as these folks over at ARS look toward the future of work, we find ourselves wondering, employers and employees alike, uh, benefit from getting some folks out of Cubeville. So what are so many businesses and managers afraid of? A surprisingly ancient argument. The idea of remote work, as we can currently imagine it, goes back about 50 years. The fight over whether employees, employees should be allowed to do remote work, whether they can in fact be trusted, oh no, <laughs> goes back almost exactly as long. The first documented use of the word telecommute showed up in 1974 when The Economist wrote, as there is no logical reason why the cost of telecommunication should vary with distance, quite a lot of people by the late 1980s will telecommute daily to their London offices while living on a Pacific island if they want to. And they should have. However, that didn't happen. Similarly, futurist writer Alvin Toffler, uh, together with his wife Heidi, um, described a concept perfectly in the 1980 book, The Third Wave. When we suddenly make available technologies that can place a low-cost workstation in any home, providing it with a smart typewriter, perhaps, along with a fax machine or a computer console, this is 1980, remember, the home computer was not the big deal yet. There was no, was no internet. And teleconferencing equipment, the possibilities for homework are radically extended. The idea of telework landed in the 70s pro and con camps formed, became entrenched and dug in rapidly thereafter. By January 1984, Time magazine had fans and foes take second looks and proliferating experimental projects in telecommuting and, at the time, still novel, but not the novel coronavirus, still novel, but potentially destined to become much less so. In the 1980s, the state of California commissioned a study on the potential costs and benefits of expanding telework among state employees. The final report, published 10 years later in 1990, is an extremely familiar tune to the one still sung today. Remote work enhances the quality of work life for telecommuters, including those with disabilities, the report found. Telecommuting more than pays its way. There are societal benefits as well. The group that compiled the report report determined that telecommuting should be encouraged to expand within state government, that every state agency should have the option of using telecommuting both as a means of improving its effectiveness and for reducing traffic congestion and air pollution. That said, the working group also cautioned that in order to be effective, the telecommuting program must be implemented properly and have its utility monitored regularly. 
anyway, this goes on and, and talks about all kinds of various other things, but uh, you get the idea. And I think now, um, with this situation that's currently going on, with, with everybody in the in the lockdown, the coronavirus lockdown, uh, the, this could be the future. Could be now. We we could be living in the future of work. Yeah, we we could definitely uh, that that could that could definitely be a thing. That could be something that goes upon goes on. <laughs> All right, getting away from the corona into something more. Last year, last year, shall we say? <laughs> although although this was published on the 18th of February uh, so a little over a month ago um, on the Daily Mail how smartphone addiction changes your brain it changes your brain are you addicted to a smartphone if so it changes your brain I, I mean I'm addicted to computers I, I, I think it would probably follow the same pattern, although I'm not sitting there looking at a miniature screen with my head bent over all day. I, I sit up straight, and I, I look at three monitors, three good-sized monitors. I, I, I don't sit there looking at one little thing trying to figure out what something says. Anyway, scans reveal how gray matter of tech addicts physically changes shape and size in a similar way to... Drug users. <laughs> you, you, when they call you a computer junkie, yeah, they're not kidding. Uh, German researchers examined the brains of 48, uh, tiny, tiny, tiny sample size, 48 participants using MRI images. Total of 22 people, uh, smartphone addicts and 26 non-addicts made up the cohort. Researchers found diminished gray matter volume in key regions of the brain. Similar phenomenon observed in people who suffer, suffer with substance addiction. Smartphone, smartphone addiction physically changes the shape and size of the human brain in a similar way to the organ of a drug addict. Images taken by an MRI scanner revealed the brains of people with SPA, or smartphone addiction. SPA, got that? <laughs> well, wait. What, 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 what would I have? What would computer computer monitor addiction, CMA, I guess? Computer monitor addiction? <laughs> have lower gray matter volume in some key parts of the brain. The images also reveal decreased activity in the brains of smartphone addicts compared to non-addicts. Similar patterns and trends of dwindling gray matter have also been recorded in the mind of drug addicts and statists. Oh, I, I added that last part. Especially statists. Um, <laughs> German researchers examined 48 participants using the MRI images, 22 with smartphone addiction and 26 non-addicts. Writing in the study published by the journal Addictive Behaviors, that's a journal. They actually have a journal called Addictive Behaviors. Imagine that. The researchers write, compared to controls, uh, individuals with smartphone addiction showed lower, <laughs> and I don't know who is writing this article here, but it says lower gay matter. <laughs> so somebody give the guy an R. Lower gray matter volume in left anterior insula, inferior temporal, and parahippocampal cortex. Decreased gray matter in one of these regions, the insula, has previously been linked to a substance addiction. They add that this is the first physical evidence of a link between smartphone use and physical addiction to the brain. The authors from Heidelberg University Right. Given the widespread use and increasing popularity, the present study questions the harmlessness, harmlessness of smartphones, at least in individuals that may be at increased risk for developing smartphone-related addictive behaviors. 
Smartphone addiction is a growing concern among scientists and medical professionals, as children especially spend more and more time on their handsets. A damage, dam, a damning report recently found most children, 53%, own a mobile phone by the age of seven years old. The report, which is based on a survey of 2,167 five to 16 year olds in the UK, goes on to say that by age 11, nine in 10 children, nine out of 10, have their own device. Phone ownership is almost universal once children are in secondary school, it revealed. It also found 57% of the children sleep with their phones by their bed. Why? And almost two in five youngsters say they could not live without their phone. They could not live without their phone. Are you shitting me? <laughs> researchers said the findings show to the extent which phones can dominate children's lives the ubiquity of phone use in society is a cause for concern as the physiological and health implications remain poorly understood experts of the latest research warn uh, let me tell you up until a couple months ago, I, I never had a smartphone. I have one now because I had to switch from my old provider, which was merging with another company that I didn't want to switch to, to a new company. And this new company, um, I could have gone ahead and figured out a, fi 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 figure, figured out a way to use my old dumb phone, uh, but it, it just it, I, it wasn't working well for me. So I switched over and I bought a cheapo smartphone which works really well but i don't take it anywhere i leave it sitting um over here next to my desk it never moves off of this little metal box uh, that that i have it on um i am would be the least i i only use it for a phone i don't even have a data plan with it <laughs> so uh, um and it costs like eight bucks a month my my, my service is eight bucks a month uh, well, with taxes and everything, closer to ten. But um, <laughs> and I, I don't know how you get two dollars tax on an eight dollars service, but they figured out a way. <laughs> but I, but I, but I um, have computers. I have computers all over the house, and I also have a couple of tablets. Um, so whether I'm addicted to a smartphone, I think that may be a moot point in a situation where you where you're on the computer most of the day uh almost all day in one way or another but it's different it, it's it's totally different than using a phone although i think the addiction may uh run in in similar a similar pattern sock puppet is telling me run that new smartphone in developer's mode yeah no i i i have done that to um uh, do some testing of certain apps which by the way speaking of apps um, I, I'm going to have to redo the apps if I stay on the, on this, this, uh, uh, new streaming service because your old apps are not going to work anymore. Your old apps are based on the IP address of the old streaming server. So they won't work anymore on the, on the new service. So <laughs> I'll have to redo those apps and I'm going to wait maybe a week before I decide what I'm going to do, uh, as far as which streaming service to go with, but I'll, it's not a big deal um, to do. It's just for the next week or so, uh, your your, your uh, Android and, and Apple um, iPhone apps are not going to work. Or, or Yeah, they won't. <laughs> no big problem, though. It's, it's simple enough. All right, so we go to wishtv.com. You ever had a you ever had a uh, one of those uh, what are they, what do they call them vanity license plates vanity license plates yeah so suppose you wanted to go down to the good old DMV in your place and said hey I want a vanity license plate with these two words on it and they said no way buddy <laughs> oh sock puppet has one all right cool 
Well, this guy over here, and let me see what, what state he was from. Kentucky. This guy in Kentucky, <laughs> he, he asked for a license plate that read, I'm God. And they said no. They said no. You, we, we can't give you a license plate that says I'm God. And, and the judge, he took it. He took it to court. He took that to court. And, and the judge said, <laughs> yes, he can. And you owe him $150,000 if you said no. <laughs> a judge has ordered the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet to pay more than $150,000 for the attorney's fees of a man who was denied of his request for a license plate that read, I'm God. A heart who says he was an, he, he is an atheist told CNN affili affiliate WXIX that he drove around Ohio with an I'm God on his plate for more than a decade. So when he moved to Kenton County, Kentucky in 2016, he put in a request to keep the same license plate. But instead, transportation officials sent him a letter denying his request, saying his request was not in good taste, and would create the potential of distraction to other drivers and possibly confrontations. Really? You're going to stop, you're going to confront somebody that, that is God or that says they're God? <laughs> In response, the Freedom From Religious Foundations and the ACLU of Kentucky filed a lawsuit on behalf of Hart in November 2016, alleging a violation of his First Amendment rights. Last November, uh, the court ruled in Hart's favor, stating, to allow such plates as, I'm for God and love God, but reject I'm God, believe or belies a viewpoint of neutrality. Uh, regardless, the court concluded that in this case, case, the statute governing the license plates is an unreasonable and therefore impermissible restriction on Mr. Hart's First Amendment rights. Following the court's ruling, Hart was allowed to obtain his custom license plate. <laughs> then last week, U.S. District uh, uh, Judge Gregory Van Tottenhove ordered the transportation cabinet to pay Hart $150,715.50 50 cents in attorney's fees as well as $491.24 in litigation costs. CNN reached out to the cabinet for further comment. I'm thankful to finally have some opportunity to select a personal message for my license plate. Uh, just as any other driver, hard side in the statement in November. There is nothing inappropriate about my view that religious beliefs are subject to individual interpretation. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Oh, all right, all right. I'm just seeing, uh, trying to see what's going on there, and if it made any sense to me, it did not. Now this next article, I don't know who the guy is personally, but he and I apparently have some similar, similar beliefs. <laughs> that, yeah, that that was not coronavirus. Sorry, not coronavirus. <laughs> well, as far as I know. <laughs> All right, this article posted on March 16th, uh, so just a couple weeks ago. <laughs> Man glad science has finally affirmed his natural instinct to stay as far away from other people as possible. <laughs> yes, indeed. South Greeley, Wyoming. Local man Greg Barring 
has pr practiced social distancing as a way of life for most of his adulthood, as have I. So he was ecstatic this week when he learned that science is finally affirming his lifestyle. He's long suspected that not interacting with other humans as much as possible is the best way to live life. But he hasn't had the, the science to back it up until now. Boring has been waiting his whole life for this moment, according to sources. Keeping six feet away away from people, avoiding large crowds, that's amateur hour, said the man who lives on a ranch in Wyoming by himself, just so he doesn't have to see people very often. I practice a minimum of 600 feet when I can help it, and the biggest crowd I'm usually uh, with is one. But, the, but man, with this out news out new outbreak, I'm wondering if I should move any further away from all these infected people, he muttered as he checked out some of the more secluded properties to the north, 600 miles away to the nearest person. That sounds ideal. When Boring goes into a crowded store, he keeps his head down and actively swerves to avoid people. Hey, I do that too. Uh, just going to grab the exact item he needs, then bolting out of there. Ideally, nobody breathes on me, nobody makes any physical contact with me, and I'm back home within the hour. I, I, I'm with you, buddy. I'm with you, buddy, a hundred percent. Now, the sad part about this article, if there is a sad part, is that it's satire. <laughs> yes, yes, it's the Babylon Bee. It's, it's a satire posting. But I guarantee you, it's accurate to many people out there. Not just me. And not just this fictitious, uh, what's his name, Greg Boring. <laughs> Lots of people do that. Lots of people are into the social distancing uh, as a lifestyle, not having anything to do uh, with, 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 <laughs> with any stupid um, <laughs> coronavirus. Oh, man. <laughs> This article is just humorous. It's, it's not satire, but I found it quite humorous. And, and because the thing is, it doesn't matter what it is that exists out there. What kind of thing that might be gross and disgusting to you, somebody out there, probably many people out there, are sexually excited by the idea of whatever that is. <laughs> and you don't have to believe me. From Motherboard, uh, Vice.com. Uh, yeah. Coronavirus porn is going viral on Pornhub. <laughs> Amidst a global health crisis, porn finds a way. Yes, the video titled... A body cam footage CDC agent investigates deserted Wuhan. You are watching from the first person point of view of Jerry, quote Jerry, a fake name, a healthcare worker in a hazmat suit stumbling around the dark remnants of the medical facility. He breathes hard, his heart pounds, and a voice coming from his walkie talkie tries and fails to get him to respond. There's a sudden brief scuffle and a woman in a hospital gown jumps jumps him, pulls his erect penis from a hole in his clean suit, suit and wordlessly fucks him. Globally, the novel coronavirus, or COVID-19, has killed more than 3,000 people and infected 90,000. Of course, this is a while ago. So, The deserted Wuhan video uh, by a couple who go, who go by Spicy and X-Rice contains a grain of truth. The Chinese city where the coronavirus started does actually seem deserted, with public uh, transit halted and residents' uh, move, movement being restricted for over a month now. Another of the videos, TSA agents detains woman suspected of coronavirus, could be a plausible news headline. If it's true that art imitates life, right now life is pretty shitty for a lot of people around the world. 
And if there's any form, art form, uh, that can turn up a fucked up situation into escape and entertainment, it's porn. <laughs> yes, oh yes, of course, coronavirus porn exists. The search for coronavirus on Pornhub returns 112 videos with titles like MILF in Coronavirus Quarantine Gets Fucked Hard for Medicine and Coronavirus Patients Fuck in, in Quarantine Room. On X Hamster, there are only four within that search term, and at least one is an older reposted video of people doing a nurse role play with face masks. But according to ex-Hamster spokesperson Alex Hawkins, following an offer last month to provide free premium accounts to regions severely affected by coronavirus, the overwhelming surge in signups outpaced ex-Hamster's ability to approve, uh, approve new accounts. I, I guess ex-Hamster's another porn site. Never even heard of that one. Um, <laughs> says, I think people are attracted to COVID-19 theme porn in the same way people who are scared of their shadow are attracted to horror movies. We are, we are all searching for things to make us come alive. Spicy, the male half of the Spicy X Rice duo, told me COVID-19 is something that brings fear and mystery to pretty much everyone in the world right now. You need to be able to feel something. And what better way to make you feel something uh, than the global crisis we're all in right now? Others attempted to educate their audience on the process of getting, of getting in the process of getting them off. Yes, educational porn. porn education. In COVID-19 coronavirus, horny slut to use protection during outbreak, performer Little Squirtles skips to her front door, kicks off her shoes and shouts, Daddy, I'm home, and so horny. Her, par her partner, Chase, Chase Pounder, emerges from the hallway wearing a face mask, his hand stuck out to stop her. Wait, don't you move a foot closer. Haven't you heard of COVID-19? He proceeds to give her a 30-second PSA on coronavirus with concision the CDC could envy. On the state of the coronavirus outbreak in China and the purpose of masks and why they should use protection during sex. Chase told me the video was inspired by an old Delta Airlines safety video. The primary goal of their video, uh, which they shared full length for free, was to help inform viewers about proper mask usage and how the virus spreads. <laughs> he said they've experienced widespread censorship of their work, as well as their efforts to raise awareness about coronavirus. <sighs> we thought we should use our porn as an avenue to get some legitimate information out with some comic relief included to get people interested and reduce our chances of being banned, Spicy said. This sparked the idea, uh, knowing every current event ends up as porn eventually, and it does. It pretty much don't matter what the event is, it's going to wind up with some porn videos. We knew people will still be searching for it on a less censored platform like Pornhub. <laughs> oh, porn education. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Now, I've talked about this before. I, I don't know if it was here in the chat on Freaker's Ball, maybe when I was talking with uh, Circle last week. Somewhere, somewhere, well, I, I, I'd, I'd spoken about this, and you've all read about it. And, and, and <laughs> well, I, I'm just going to say, any of you out there that have cash, you know, folding paper money, it's dirty. It's filthy. It's probably infected with coronavirus. And the best thing you could do with it is to put it all in an envelope. Seal that envelope up. 
Not with your tongue, because that might be infected too. Seal that envelope up and mail it to me, and I'll make sure it, it is st properly disposed of. Because cash, cash is dirty, filthy, infected. <laughs> Blacklistednews.com via Zero Hedge on March 4th. The WHO, as Hal says, not the rock group, not an owl. The WHO urges people to go cashless because dirty banknotes can spread the virus. Send them all. Get them, get them in them envelopes. Send them my way. You don't want that dirty money anywhere around you. Following reports that Beijing had quarantined dirty cash, the WHO warned on Monday that the virus could survive on banknotes, potentially spreading COVID-19 within communities and across the world. To reduce the risk of being infected by money, the NGO advised citizens in countries struggling with outbreaks to favor digital payments when possible. The, that the WHO is telling people to avoid cash is hardly a surprise. Research has found that coronaviruses have been found to live on surfaces for as long as nine days. During the statement, a WHO spokesman referenced the Bank of England study claiming that banknotes can carry, carry bacteria or viruses and urged people to wash their hands for at least 20 seconds, and sing that little song. Uh, other studies have shown that 90% of, of, of U.S. $1 bills had bacteria present, and one Swiss study found that viruses had survived on the faces of Swiss francs for days. The WHO warnings follow the People's Bank of China last month, uh, started disinfecting currency deposit at Chinese banks with ultraviolet light before quarantining the bills for a week before releasing them back into circulation. Uh, Brits and their fellow Europeans should be increasingly careful as the virus spreads across Europe, the WHO warned via the telegraph. We know that money changes hands frequently and can pick up all sorts of nasty, dirty, disgusting bacteria and viruses, the spokesman told the Telegraph. We should, we would, we do advise people to wash their hands after handling banknotes and avoid touching their face. When possible, it would be also be advisable to use contactless payments to reduce the risk of transmission. Of course, that one world's major NGO is seizing the opportunity to proclaim the virtues of paperless money is hardly a surprise. The globalist push towards a cashless society has been underway for years now, having had its biggest success in Scandinavia. Sweden has gone virtually cashless in such a short time they're already confronted with many, many drawbacks of relying exclusively on digital money. As has been noted here on Blacklisted News uh, previously, this is what happens next. The virus spreads throughout Europe and uh, U.S., and governments respond in the same way China did. Martial law and full-blown concentration camp culture. This would lead to civil war in the U.S. because, well... We're armed to the freaking teeth, and many people would shoot anyone trying to put us into a quarantine camp. Europe is mostly screwed, because they're not armed at all. The establishment then suggests that paper money be removed from the system because it's a virus spreader. China is already pushing that solution now. Magically, we find ourselves in a cashless society in a matter of a year, maybe two, uh, which is what the globalists have been demanding for years. Everything goes digital, and thus, even local economies become completely centralized as private trade dies.
a viral outbreak is a significant danger to us all, but an even greater threat is supposed to <laughs> is is the supposed cure. Trading our economic and social freedom in the name of stopping the coronavirus? No matter how deadly the bug, it just ain't worth it. Uh, it just ain't worth it. Don't mean they're not going to do it. They're going to they're going to they're going to try try like hell to get this done. Uh, they 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 want to be able to track and trace everything you do, every penny that you either take in or spend. They want to know. Well, that's that's one of their goals. There's there's many goals involved here, Java Doctor. Um, a cashless society uh, tracking and tracing is is merely one of your spending. Also, the tracking and tracing of your movements via that aforementioned smartphone that so many people are so addicted to uh that's a huge one as well uh pretty much everything and anything you do they want to know uh for massive control infinitesimal little tiny down to the individual control and the ability to cut you off very good rob works yes <laughs> no question about that oh god now on this next article, which was posted on March 4th on TechDirt.com from the Your Rights Will Be Respected at the Discretion of the Government, Apparently, Department. <laughs> Did you catch that? This is from the Your Rights Will Be Respected at the Discretion of the Government, Apparently, Department. <laughs> the fact that a court had to had to actually do this because a cop didn't understand this is disturbing. But here it is. The court tells the cop that a person invoking their rights is not suspicious behavior. Yee. To some cops, there's nothing more inherently suspicious than the invocation of rights. It appears they believe only guilty people do this. The innocent have no need for rights, because if they've nothing to hide, uh, then they have nothing to fear. It takes a court to remind officers that the rights are everyone's rights. Everyone has these rights, whether or not they're guilty of anything. This case deals with an officer who treated someone's invocation of rights as the const as the constitutional approval constitutional approval he needed to search someone. He was wrong. It all started with a traffic stop that really wasn't a traffic stop. Two officers staking out a high crime area decided to follow a van that drove by them. After discovering the plate on the van actually belonged to a Chevy Silverado, the officers decided to initiate a stop. But it was too late. The van had already reached its destination and was parked in a driveway. The officers pulled up behind it and parked, exiting the car to speak to the driver. By the time they did this, the passenger, Antonio Arrington, had already exited the vehicle and headed toward the house. While passengers can be questioned and searched in vehicles during traffic stops, Arrington was no longer in the van when the cops pulled up behind the vehicle to perform the stop. Arrington argued the officers had no reasonable suspicion to detain him and question him, acts that led to the discovery of drugs and a weapon. The court agrees and makes two critical findings. Uh, by the time Fritt initiated the traffic stop, Arrington was no longer a passenger in the van, was on private property, did nothing suspicious, and should never have been subject to an investigation in connection with the traffic stop. And two, even if Arrington was still a passenger when the traffic stop was initiated, Norris admitted that the only focus of his investigation was to investigate Arrington for other criminal activity. 
For this, he did not have reasonable, articulable suspicion necessary for a continued investigatory, investigatory detention. The court says the traffic stop, such as it was, was justified, and that could have encompassed Arrington if he had still been in the vehicle. But the Supreme Court's Rodriguez decision doesn't just affect drivers, it also affects passengers. The speedy, but unrelated, criminal investigation is still a violation of rights, even if it did not unreasonably prolong the stop. It's the expansion that's the problem. In sharp contrast to Step, this court knows exactly what Norris, the backup officer, was doing when he admittedly did not ask any questions about the traffic investigation. While not prolonged by the addition of time, the original traffic investigation was certainly unreasonably expanded. Rodriguez cautions that the reasonableness of the stop depends on what the police officer fact, in fact does. Rodriguez, uh, citing some cases here, uh, Norris, in fact, engaged in an investigation unrelated to the traffic stop. Officer Norris tried to argue that he did have reasonable suspicion, suspicion to detain Arrington. In concluding that Arrington was engaged in criminal activity, Norris testified that he relied upon three things. Arrington's attempted attempt to divert attention from himself by speaking loudly. By speaking loudly? How does he know how the guy normally talks? Arrington would not tell Norris what was in his pockets. Why should he? And Norris noticed an irregular bulge in Arrington's pants. I mean, pocket. <laughs> so, this cop's checking out the guy's bulge. <laughs> but, <clears throat> but the first of those three things was Arrington loudly telling an officer to leave him alone because he knew his rights. Officer Norris did not testify that Arrington became noticeably more nervous as time progressed, in fact, Arrington's agitation with the officer seemed to result from his repeated requests that they terminate his encounter when he informed him that he understood his legal rights. The, the article goes on and the, the affidavit's in here that you can read for yourself, but yeah, ask, tell, telling somebody you know your rights and invoking those rights is is not any kind of admission of guilt of anything. All right. <laughs> now, over recent weeks, uh, people, at least a couple few people here in the chat, have asked me about the copper vessel and drinking water from the copper vessel. So I decided to bring up an article here about the benefits that you get. It's, it's an Ayurveda site. Um, Ayurveda, Ayurvedic medicine, uh, it's ancient, ancient, thousands of years old, Ayurvedic medicine. Med med medicine. Uh, this article is from uh, 2018, February 12th. The benefits of drinking from a copper vessel. And uh, if you need a link to one, I'll give you a link, certainly. Uh, anyway, in Ayurveda, drinking water that has been cleansed and ionized in a copper vessel is a common practice. In India, the transformed therapeutic water taken from copper cup, or as I use, it's a tall thing with a screw cap on it, uh, taken from a copper cup is called tamrajal. Uh, copperized water is a natural antioxidant that helps balance the, the three doshas of the body, kapha, vada, and pita. Uh, the trace amount of copper in tam, tamrajal Tamara Jal <laughs> is safe and healthy, even when added to other normal dietary sources of copper. To illustrate this point, have you ever wondered why drinking multiple glasses of water a day, you still feel thirsty and not energized? In order to make, make drinking water safe, water treatments plants use filtration systems to remove most contaminants. These systems make water safe for drinking, but they also destroy water's vital life energy 
and drastic, drastically shift its natural pH. By the time your drinking water has been treated, traveled great distances through water pipes and gets into your glass, it's lost much of its vital vitality, tasting dead. As a result, the water we drink is not easily absorbed by ourselves, leaving us wanting more. The Tamara recharges the vitality of your drinking water. It ionizes, energizes, and balances pH, making the water alive again. This energized water is better absorbed by your cells and therefore enhances hydration. Since the ancient times, Ayurveda has advocated the benefits of drinking water from a copper vessel. Ayurveda states that when you store water in a copper vessel, it has the ability to balance all three doshas, the vata, the kapha, and the pitta, in your body. This happens because the copper vessel positively charges the water. Scientifically speaking, when water is stored in a copper vessel for over eight hours, it's it, very small quantities of copper get dissolved into this water. This process is called ologiodynamic, yeah, easy for you to say, effect, and has the ability to destroy a wide range of harmful microbes, molds, fungi, etc., due to the toxic effect it has on living cells. The positively charged water is extremely good for health, even though sometimes it may taste a bit odd, although I have never noticed that. It is worth noting that this water never becomes stale and can be stored for a long time. Water stored in copper vessels has a number of health benefits. Some of the most widely recognized ones include stimulates brain function, promotes digestion, boots, boosts bone strength, regulates the function of thyroid gland, combats arthritis and joint pain, you listen to that, Beetle, boosts skin health, regulates body fat, improves fertility, slows the process of aging, helps efficiently heal wounds, improves cardiovascular health, and acts as an anti-carcinogenic. Like I said, if you want the link to an, uh, a copper, an Ayurvedic-approved copper drinking vessel, I'll, I'll give you one. Um, it, it, I, I use mine, I, I fill mine twice a day, and I, so I drink it down twice a day. Um, once in the morning before my, while my coffee is perking, uh, before, before that, and then once again with dinner. So it gets a good eight hours uh, between each refill, and so it gets all that function going on. All right, and lastly, but not leastly, one of my favorite topics, one of my favorite substances, another benefit for y'all, another benefit for y'all, from CollectiveSpark.xyz. Baking soda can remove large amounts of pesticide residue from fruits and vegetables. And let me tell you, um, I've been doing this, since I read this article, which is not that long, about a month now, um, <laughs> but a, a couple, three batches of apples that I've cleaned. So I just, I mix up some, some baking soda and water in a large bowl, and then I put, put the apples in there, and I let them soak for a period of, uh, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour. And, 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 wow, wow. All right, by now, many of us are aware of the importance of eating organic produce and other foods. Anyway, just let me just tell you, you just soak you just soak your your fruits or vegetables uh and it says to soak them for fifteen minutes, but like I said, I do it for forty five minutes to an hour and uh <laughs> and and those apples and 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 you you know, roll them around a little bit, make sure they all get completely coated and stuff and and, and that baking soda uh will will clean those nasty ass pesticides off of your fruits and vegetables so uh, just something to consider, man. Uh, and I, I love baking soda for all kinds of purposes. And, um, and that's just another one. That's just another one. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> all right. This has been episode 65. 65, am I correct? Um, yes, episode 65 of the Grim Leftovers show. So uh, thank you all for tuning in so much. And uh, I'll be back again next Monday with episode 66. Uh, 
unless coronavirus gets me. Ah! <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> uh, have a good week. Check out the schedule on realmedia.com. Peace.